پادکست Welcome back to the AI Summit in Sarajevo, Kiss the Future. Uh, right now in my studio is Mr. Boris Tsergol uh, in front of the company called Comtrade System Integration. Uh, Boris is the head of AI for the Comtrade System Integration. I have to repeat it because there are lots of Comtrades uh, within the group. That's true, that's true. Uh, and basically, Boris, welcome. Yeah, welcome thank you, thank you. Uh, good to be here. Thanks for yeah. inviting me. Uh, it's a great opportunity. Uh, the whole event is about something that you are doing on a daily basis. Uh, so uh, I would like to know a bit more about uh, your background in the AI. Uh, and also uh, afterwards we can jump on what the company itself is doing basically uh, for the and in the uh, AI industry. Yeah, so, you know, my, my path has taken me through, I would say, by now, through multiple periods of, of AI. So initially, I started uh, my career as, a, as actually a mathematician. Um, yeah. Then I did a PhD in mathematical statistics. Um, for a period, I did, uh, like, uh, algorithms in quantitative finance. But then I made a, a switch uh, rather soon, fortunately, to uh, data science uh, implementation consulting. For, for nine years, I had my own company that was doing this uh, primarily in the Slovenian market. Um, then I made, uh, through that part, you know, uh, from, let's say, doing predictive analytics, I moved uh, towards more like deep learning, did some computer vision in uh, manufacturing. Um, and uh, yeah, then I made a switch to, uh, to, to larger IT services companies. Uh, and I, I think that, uh, uh, you know, like the, the key period uh, or key opportunity for me was in, in 2020 when uh, I, I managed to get this early access to GPT-3 model. Mm -hmm. uh, it was like the summer of 2020. And uh, ever since then, I was really focused a lot on, uh, on, on generative AI, on various kinds of applications of language models. Uh, so I did quite a bit of that previously uh, uh, in, in Endava where I was the regional head of data discipline. Um, and now that I am at uh, country system integration, this really still remains uh, a very, very important focus that, yeah. that also we as a company have in AI. Yeah. What I want to ask you, because uh, as you mentioned right now, uh, you have been in the predictive analysis, uh, probably in all of these machine, machine learning uh, stuff. Uh, when I speak with, let's say, elderly people or those who are not from the industry, uh, when you just show them the chat GPT, nothing else from it, it's a mind blow. So let's do it this way. Let's explain to the, let's call, let's call it amateurs or those who do not understand what in fact is AI. Yeah, so the, the, way, the way I see it, you know, is like... Um, a AI is the, the way to basically create automatic problem solving. You know? So how to uh, solve problems uh, uh, of really various kinds using uh, you know, computer systems. But you know, potentially it could be even something else than computer yeah. because artificial is a very general, general yeah. term, right? Um, however, I guess it's important to then split you know, a bit uh, across different categories, you know, what is AI. So maybe I'll mention something, you know, that's not, I feel like it's not often, you know, pointed out, right? That is, people talk a lot about mach machine learning, right? So machine learning is a part of AI, but it's just to say the way how the system learns some things, right? It's not, as, and, and as we know also as humans, you know, if you learn something that doesn't necessarily mean that this will also be something that you will be doing. Um, so that second part of AI uh, is uh, what I sometimes call, uh, a bit jokingly, a machine doing. Mm -hmm. Or I guess you know, the more professional term would be inference um, rather than training. Um, so, and, and also one distinction of course can be, uh, I think it's an important one still for many people in, in various kinds of industries, that it used to be that a lot of what was considered AI was uh, actually, you know, this predictive analytics kind of thing where basically if you had a certain kind of like data point, 
you just wanted to guess some information about that data point. You know, like it would be if you had an image of something, you would, using this predictive analysis, you would predict whether there is a certain type of object on the image or not. Mm. And then with, with the generative AI, you are basically creating that data itself. Mm. However, of course, this data should be up to a point similar to the data on which the model was trained. Mm. And uh, yeah, and why, why generative AI is interesting today, and why, you know, how we can look at it and see why it's being actually very, very useful uh, uh, in industries and so on, is that you could consider it that if you have some data, um, you know, it can be of very different kinds, either text or images or sound, using generative AI, you can transform this data into a different form that is much more useful to you. Mm -hmm. So you can, do, yeah, you can do things that, you know, you can generate text from a recording of people speaking, right? Or you can take uh, an image and create a different image based on certain instructions that you put mm -hmm. in. Cool. And um, I'm interested in uh, your current role. Uh, what are your main focuses on developing? So where do you see, maybe that's even wiser to ask, where do you see the biggest uh, uses of the AI and the fastest ones? Yeah, so when it comes to use cases, um, it used to be that AI could only be applied in, in very niche cases, right? So actually, one of the key things that experts could bring to the table was knowing where to possibly apply AI in order to realize value. Um, with generative AI, it's a different story because the technology has reached a point where it's very general and also it doesn't require huge initial investment to start using it. As you mentioned, you know, like yeah. you can have a person who's actually not a professional uh, like yeah. AI user still use all of these tools. Um, so um, the, 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 the way I'm looking now at it is cu currently what we are seeing as, as chatbots, right? Uh, you know, yeah. many people now even start to, you know, someone mentions like uh, generative AI and something, they immediately, they immediately think chatbots. Yeah. So, and, and sure, chatbots are very useful and you, you can apply them, you know, whenever there is a need to make information more easier to access, yeah. right? You, you know, you, you know, you want to answer a customer's question in a call center, or maybe some employee wants some information rela related to like internal rules of the company. Uh, all of these kinds of things you can solve with the chatbots. But where things will be moving is that now for the chatbots, usually you are just asking them something and then they get you back information. So the next logical step is that you will not ask them for information, but rather you will give them a task, mm -hmm. right? So maybe you will send them a document and say, you know, just, just fill this out or do something, whatever with it. And it will not necessarily be this real time conversation. You know, the bot will, maybe it will do its thing. Mm -hmm. Potentially it could, you know, the bot maybe will have to ask some people for additional information and whatever workflow uh, uh, that it will start. And then when it's done, it will get back to you. Mm -hmm. right? So that's, yeah. Uh, that's one change, right? Um, also, currently, <coughs> um, so a lot of people, <coughs> sorry, um, are using AI just by providing these short instructions. Yeah. You know, they just ask this brief question and uh, get some answer. And, uh, you know, o yeah. often th the answer is not so good. Yeah. They are not uh, prompting adequately. <laughs> yes, yeah, but it's not just about prompting. It's just you d they don't provide the necessary context. Uh, so, so if we imagine... Um, let's say, you know, this company environment, you have some information that you got, uh, you know, through yeah. emails, then you had a conversation in the meeting and you discussed something. And then there are some documents that you would have to. So usually when in this work environment, when you actually then finally do something as an employee, you do it with all of that context around you that is sort of informing yeah. you what you even have to do. Um, but now with this latest models, this is actually becoming possible, you know, to take in enormous amount of context you know, all of this yeah. information that is spread around, put everything into the model as part of its prompt mm -hmm. and then let it answer. And yeah. what I realized, because this is something that I, you know, you know my perf personal workflows 
do a lot is that the, the results that you get back in terms of quality are incredibly better, mm -hmm. right? It's just you know, a question of this, of this context. And then if we, if we look a bit further away, you could imagine, you know, for, for every, let, let's say you are a, let's say, in a management role in a company. Um, so I think every manager is, is happy, at least if they are a good manager, yeah. when things go the right way without them having to, you know, expressly <coughs> specified exactly what needs yeah. to be done. So currently with AI, it looks like, the AI is only working when you are looking at it. You know, yeah. it, it would be, if, if this was a company, imagine like a thousand employees and every single one would only be working as long as the manager would be looking at them. Yeah. Nobody would want such yeah. a company, right? So in the next stage of AI, these things will have more autonomy and you know, they will do their own thing. And when something happens that you need to know about, those systems will reach out to you. They, they won't wait for you to ask them to provide yeah. this information. No, they will filter out based on knowing your context. Um, they will filter out what's really relevant for you. And uh, when you need to know it, they will get to you. Yeah. But how do we in this stage, uh, how do we give them borders on how much autonomy they have? And uh, are we able to uh, go over the bias that it potentially has? Because why I'm asking it, because uh, I'm an economist and uh, usually in the economy there are always two or three right answers. Uh, yeah. There is always somebody who uh, gave the prediction and uh, somebody who gave the opposite prediction. They were both assuming but some, one of them had like was right uh, a year after. So the, the, the economy itself, it can always have many answers and of course, biases and different thoughts of these economists. And uh, how do we decide or how do we make a border over over its own autonomy and the, the right answer? Yeah, so, you know, I'm not I'm not really saying just yeah. let's let's give them yeah. all autonomy, let them run around, yeah. do whatever they want. Um, actually, I think it's really important as companies scale those kinds of applications mm -hmm. beyond just this small start kickoff yeah. POCs, right? That they have good systems. So one of the systems or parts of the system that they need to set up is evaluation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, because these models are very general. Um, so if you just ask them like a few questions, you know, they might respond after the change in the same way. Yeah. But if you ask them 10 more questions, you would only then notice that that they have changed. Yeah. So um, the only way I think to, to put some control on this is to, to have a process where, you know, like other models are evaluating these ones by asking yeah. them, you know, enormous amount of questions to, yeah. to see whether they are still performing the, you know, whether yeah. the answers match what, what the answers yeah. are, are supposed to be. Um, uh, so, however, when you mentioned the the, the, the bias, right? Um, I mean, what, what kind of bias do you have in mind when you, when you say that? Well, for example, if we look at GPT, uh, there are always in our world topics which people do not agree on it with. And yeah, Ch 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 GPT will collect some, some of these or all of these data that are over the internet and uh, sometimes they can be wrong or can show their bias or if let's say uh, a person who is um, uh, deciding on what's allowed or not allowed can put their own bias uh, within the company so uh, how do we in fact extract that part of of not a wrong answer but the not that the, the one that might not be the right one yeah I mean, whether the, the answer is based in reality or not, so there's many different ways how yeah. to approach it. So currently, the, the most commonly used approach is called the RAG, right, Retrieval Augmented Generation, mm -hmm. where before the chatbot answers a question, it actually looks into some documents yeah. that have been vetted. Um, it doesn't always work. Um, it, it also doesn't capture necessarily things that, you know, like the model might be biased in in spite of seeing that yeah. that information, 
Um, however, uh, what I would argue is that, you know, in some cases, maybe it would make sense to put how we work with AI system in contrast uh, with how we work with people. Usually with people, uh, it takes time to build trust. And also, you won't necessarily trust that person in every case, yeah. right? So what you learn through time by working with people is that some people can be extremely reliable when it comes to certain tasks. And sometimes when it comes to a different set of tasks, you know in advance that probably they won't be reliable. And the same thing happens with, with language models yeah. or AI systems as we work more with them. And if we have the right evaluation system in place, we sort of can define the scope where actually we are very confident that, that the model is doing what it should. But also, after we define the scope, this also means that there are cases where you know, we, we should have doubts and strong ones whether what we get from the model is correct. And so it's really important to explain this to the workforce that is using these models, mm -hmm. that they should, you know, they, they, they should not in any case just assume what they get from the model is, um, you know, is, is truly correct. However, we should also not expect them to always check what they get from the model mm -hmm. because, you know, as this trust is built, there should be some like reasonable expectation that the output for this particular task is correct and perhaps doesn't require in-depth checking and validation mm -hmm. because if we did that you yeah. know we would remove a lot of the benefits yeah. of automation that AI brings anyhow yeah. right interesting time that times that we are living in uh, and in fact I'm quite happy really happy that we are doing this in Sarajevo uh, and I'm happy that we are all sharing uh, our thoughts and dilemmas and worries and optimism, of course, uh, on all of it. Boris, thank you very much. It was inspirational. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. It was, yeah. it was great.